Welcome to the Good Growing Podcast. I am Chris Enroth, horticulture educator with University of Illinois Extension, coming at you from a getting cold Macomb, Illinois. And we have got a jam-packed show for you today, folks. I mean, this is huge, is busting at the seams. Um, we're going to be talking about native plants. So we have three outstanding uh, designers on the show with us today as our special guest. Uh, but before we introduce them, we must get to our co-hosts that are with us every single week. We are joined by local foods educator Katie Parker in Adams County. Hello, Katie. Hello, Chris. How are you doing? I am doing wonderfully. You know, it it has been hovering at freezing for the last few days, and then it got foggy, and now all that fog has <laughs> crystallized in the tree canopies. Yeah, and, I noticed that. Oh, it's, it's so pretty. pretty. Cool. Yeah. yeah. How are things down in your neck of the woods? Oh, it's cold here as well. Um, did you check in? Did the groundhog see its shadow this morning? Oh, I, you know, I've been in Zoom meetings most of the day. <laughs> I have I, no idea what happened. Do you? Did you hear? I I don't know. Oh, I bet I, I know who has heard. Ken's, do you think Ken Johnson? Ken, do you know? Oh I my have not gosh. heard either. I haven't looked yet. <laughs> oh, the at-home school goodness. service of the Johnson house. Did not have Groundhog Day celebrations. We haven't gotten to that lesson yet today. <laughs> <laughs> well, Ken Johnson, horticulture educator in Jacksonville, uh, is usually on top of what's going on with Poxitani Phil, but not today. So um, it looks like Wendy just sent us a message here. Uh, looks like he did, in fact, <laughs> see his shadow. So, so what does that mean? Um, COVID nineteen for two more months. What what does that mean? I don't understand. Or winter. More winter. Get I'm excited. Really, I'm excited too. I feel like, I don't know, we haven't really had um, like a very Midwesterny winter. It's been a, it's been more of a southerly winter. I don't know. I haven't had to bust out the snow shovel at all. Um, really? No. I mean, just for fun. We So we built like a little snow fort. I scraped like the half inch of snow off the driveway and we built a little fort for the kids. But then you know, it just... It hasn't been a need for that. We need a good polar vortex. Yeah, that's what we need, a good polar vortex. You know, and to, to, to withstand something like that, you have to be an, a, a native individual, like an adapted organism to an area, a region. And today we are going to be talking all about plants that are native to the Midwest here, to Illinois. And so we have got some special guests that I would like to introduce now. Um, we are going to be chatting with landscape designers, architects, horticulturists here on the Good Growing Podcast. So uh, let's just kick it off by uh, introducing them here. So we are joined first off by Austin Little, horticulture educator. Um, hey, Austin, down there in, in, in the corner, on my screen at least, I see you. Hello. Happy Groundhog's Day from uh, sunny Southern Illinois. We've got some sun today, so... Yeah, you know, talking about southern southerly winters. Yeah, welcome, welcome to my world. It's just it's either uh, cloudy and wet or sunny and wet. It's just you know always some or hot and wet down here in southern Illinois. So it's always some form of wet. Um, but, uh, yeah. So uh, I, I'm a horticulture educator in uh, southern Illinois, kind of based in Jackson County. And uh, my background is in uh, ecological landscaping, green infrastructure, uh, some urban agriculture, you know, kind of uh, small scale home gardening. So that's that's my background. And more and more, I've, I've gotten to focus on uh, native plants and, and using native plants in landscaping. So when you're when you're looking at things like green infrastructure, green gardens, uh, Things of that nature, you're you're really looking at using native plants quite a bit. So, so I'm I'm really happy to be here. I've been a fan of the show for a long time. So, uh, thanks for having me on today. Well, we are happy you are here, Austin. And I've known Austin for a long time as well. We went to school together in Quincy um, back when we were littler, <laughs> younger. <laughs> and then we both. Did you study under Karen Midden down at Southern Illinois? Yeah, Karen was my main mentor, and uh, I work, she was my main uh, professor that I worked for for my master's degree. So uh, I took every class I could with Karen, and uh, she was a, a huge influence on on kind of how I look at 
landscaping and the natural environment, kind of how those two things connect, you know, the built environment with the natural environment and, and how those meet. So, so yeah, Karen is, is, a, is a really great uh, landscape architect and uh, really promoted the green infrastructure at SIU as well. She was instrumental in getting us uh, involved in the green roof, rain garden, green wall, uh, all of those great things. So yeah, I, I, was, I was definitely uh, fortunate to be able to work with Karen and learn from Karen. I would, I'm right there with you. She really pushed me to go on and get my master's in landscape architecture. So I'm very grateful to have had been able to study and work with her. Definitely. Yes. And we are also joined by horticulture educator, Martha Smith. Hello, Martha. Hey guys, how you doing? No complaints uh, from the good growing <laughs> crew here. <laughs> you know, Chris, we don't live that far away. And if you haven't used your snow shovel yet this year, there's some kind of weird dividing line because we're only about 35 miles apart mm -hmm. and we've had some significant snows. So you're in a, you're in a tropical area now. I, I know exactly what you're talking about. So I have been, Martha, you're in Monmouth and I have been up mm -hmm. in that area just, well, yesterday even. Mm -hmm. um, so traveling through there and I don't know what it is. You get to Monmouth and all of a sudden there's piles of snow. Like people have had to move snow there. So that's pretty incredible. Yeah, snow and ice. But um, no, just to introduce myself, I'm a horticulture educator and I am out of the Quad Cities. Uh, so that's about 40 miles north of here. So I really consider myself Northern West Central Illinois. So happy to be here and thanks for inviting me. Happy to have you here. And we have our third uh, guest here. We have Lane Kenoki. Now, Lane, you are on campus, uh, the Champaign-Urbana area. Is that correct? Right. Yeah, I've, I've been splitting my time between uh, the Champaign campus and uh, southern Macoupin County uh, down by St. Louis. But today I'm coming to you from uh, windy, cold, and snowy Champaign. <laughs> <laughs> well, wonderful. Ooh. And Lane, I first uh, met you at a presentation about um, the Red Oak Rain Garden, which your background there, we can see in your image, <laughs> the Red Oak Rain Garden. And so, uh, Lane, the the imagery and um, I, I know uh, your um, Eliana Brown, who you work with, mm -hmm. she shared design plans and things that you have worked on. I mean, beautiful work in creating these native plant landscapes there. So we are yeah, excited to you. have you here. Yeah, absolutely. I'm I'm super excited to be here uh, to to talk about my my biggest passion. So, and and about that biggest passion, Lane. Let's start with you. Um, and we'll ask this of of our three special guests. But I'm curious, what is a native plant for our listeners? Maybe this is a new concept for some people. Sure. Yeah. I mean. Uh, you could throw so many different different um, definitions at this, but. Uh, when I think of native plants, I'm thinking of, you know, your local, here's another word that's going to need to be defined, but ecotype. Um, so if you are located in, let's say, central Illinois, uh, you're probably going to be in a prairie uh, ecosystem. Uh, most of the, the land around you uh, before development would have been uh, a prairie ecosystem. Um, lots of tall grasses, uh, forbs, and things of that nature. Um, so uh, you uh, have things like coneflowers. I'll use that as an example, the picture behind me. Uh, one of the best native plants, super well known. Um, it is adapted to uh, the climate of central Illinois and many other places, but using central Illinois as, as my example here. Um, it's adapted to the climate, to um, the, the moisture conditions, to the sunlight conditions. Uh, there's a whole host of pollinators that have adapted alongside with it. Um, so there's sort of co-benefits that exist between the two. Um, and I mean, we could go on and on about the definition, but uh, I'd be glad to hear uh, anyone else's um, opinions or additions to that. Yeah, Martha, Austin, what I mean, I've heard so many definitions of native plants, and for for it depends on who you talk to, where they place them. So, what, um, yeah, what what do you feel in, in that regard? Well, for me, um, I have been in many many 
discussions on you know what is native. Uh, years ago, it, it was getting so to the point where they were going back to when the continental plates shifted and divided. And I said, no, well, that's that's going way too far back. Um, so, you know, you hear definitions of a plant that's been around since X date, or it's a plant that's been around since scientific information was, was being collected. And, you know, for me, uh, I just like plants. So I am not pro-native. I am not anti-native. I just, you know, let's all just get along and plant what we can. But uh, there's a lot of definitions out there. And when I do talk to someone, when they ask me this, it's really, what is the definition that you're accepting? What is the definition that you are trying to work around? Um, as Lane said, you know, do you want it to be native to your part of the state? Do you want it to be native to the upper Midwest? Do you just want it to be native to somewhere in North America? So there's all these different labels and, and it's, it's it gets interesting. Austin, yeah, pretty thorough definitions. Anything else to add? They, they covered it really well. Um, I mean, it's, yeah, native is relative to what your, the system or, you know, environment that you're talking about. And what's the, the NRCS, I believe their definition is, is uh, plants that were endemic to these, these environments in, in North America, in South America, pre-colonial, uh, pre, pre-colonialization. So, so pre-incursion from from uh, Europe, but I mean, even that gets kind of into a gray area because there's different, uh, you know, different uh, beliefs on on when that happened. So, mm -hmm. so I think it just comes down to how long if that if this plant has had enough time to become in kind of a, in a in a stasis or balance with the with its environment. So is it. Is it a plant that's being utilized for food, for uh, reproduction, for habitat? Uh, is, it, uh, is it part of kind of a positive cycling of, of uh, it, natural cycles within that kind of, within that context? So I say it's relative. Um, and, and the question is how long does it take for something to go from, you know, everything came from somewhere else. So, um, you know, as an example on a volcanic island, how long does it take for a plant to, to reach that definition of, of native. So it's relative. Um, I, I think it definitely takes uh, at least a, a, you know, a long time, thousands of years, I would say. So, it's so something, yeah. Dandelion still has a little bit more time before we can call yeah. it an official mm -hmm. North American native. Maybe one more millennium. May, give it one more. Okay, just one, just one. I like that, so. So if you had to choose just one reason, why do you select native plants? Well, there's the whole um, you know, debate about pollinators um, seem to prefer native plants versus the non-natives. But again, that's debatable. There um, you know, has been some research. I know Doug Ptolemy has done some, some re research on native plants. In fact, our uh, cohort, Ryan Pankow, um, wrote a very nice article and kind of um, tried to uh, put into a summary what um, Doug Tallamy was was researching, uh, but it still, you know, came down to, you know, what is your definition? Um, you know, for me to pick out a native plant, um, I have to, number one, like it. And I also, we have had experience with natives in very small spaces that tend to escape. And so, you know, you've got to think where if you're in a, you know, five acre prairie, okay. But if you're trying to do something on a small urban plot, you have to be a little careful with your selections. So if, if it's one kind of benefit or feature for me, it's, it's the reduced care that natives need over time. So a, a new native plant thing is gonna need, you know, an equivalent amount of uh, resources that other plants are gonna take. But over time, 
the idea is they're tolerant to our natural environment, so they're going to need less uh, inputs like uh, fertilizers, pesticides, herbicides. Uh, they're going to be more resistant to disease, uh, to drought, so less water during the heat of the summer. So they're just more adapted to our conditions and uh, they, they have a longer, healthier life usually. And that, that to me is the, utility, the, the, the beauty of it, the beauty in utility of native plants. Yeah, uh, for me, um, it's, it's hard to, to just choose one reason, um, but uh, that, that drought tolerance uh, that, that Austin uh, mentioned, um, you know, some of our, our native species here have roots that'll go down over 10 feet into the soil, they are built, they are adapted, made for uh, drought conditions. Um, and oftentimes we have those kinds of conditions in those small spaces, uh, you know, in our home gardens and, and so on. Um, but also, you know, you bring in um, uh, insects that are specialized to pollinate a certain native plant or um, species that are dependent on uh, some native species. The monarch butterfly is, is a really great example of that. You know, it's dependent on uh, milkweed um, to, uh, you know, lay its eggs on uh, and, and so forth. Um, so being able to uh, plant those, those certain species uh, that you know have, have benefits for, you know, its pollinators and, and other things that rely on it. Um, it's, it's, it's really a, a, a great feeling uh, to, to have your native garden, uh, you know, like that. And uh, Ken, Katie, I, I failed to ask you at the top of the show. I, I wanted to get a, a reading from you as well. Now, do either of you incorporate natives into your landscaping? We sure do. Ken, I'm, I'm guessing as a pollinator person, you, you definitely do. Yeah, so we've got a couple different spots in our yard, our, our hell strip, the boulevard, whatever you want to call it. We've replaced all the grass in there with some native grasses and flowers, and then we've got a patch in our backyard uh, next to our garage that we've put in grasses and, and native flowers in. Well, I, I feel like you're you're both on a, a better track than I am, because I if someone asks me, like, hey, what's your favorite native? If I'm at, like, a prairie, like a, a wild, woolly kind of place, I'm like, oh, that's easy, sylphiums cut plant, rosin weed, uh, prairie dock, uh, compass plant. You know, I love silphiums. But if someone's like, hey, what native plants do you want to plant in your yard? I become paralyzed. I do mm -hmm. not know what to pick because I have a finite space and it has so many goals that I needed to accomplish there. So um, our, our guests today, they've each prepared their top three native plants. And so I'm going to be making notes so that I can get uh, maybe a, a couple better ideas of what to, uh, to order and grow this year in my yard. So what we've got here is uh, my slides for my favorite native plants. I, I like that this one's first because I think if I'm gonna number them, then American persimmon is right now my number one favorite. I, I really love this tree. And I guess kind of a, kind of a qualifier for my plants is that I realize that these are all really kind of Southern Illinois natives. Um, I think that's just kind of a, 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 as a, as a kind of a reaction to, or, or an effect of the plants that I tend to recommend in my area. And so, yeah, they, these are mostly going to be plants that are found only in the Southern part of the state. So some of them maybe would go a little bit further North, but that's kind of, um, I guess my, also these are all trees and shrubs. And so that kind of speaks to my, my preference for that kind of landscaping. I do like forbs and flowers. I really like ornamental grasses, but I, I just really enjoy and, and, and I feel like, uh, I, I really feel like uh, there's a, a, a real a kind of aesthetic and, and kind of, uh, I, I like landscapes that are like rooms almost that have walls and ceilings and and so you get that with trees and shrubs and these kind of larger elements in the landscape so um, I just wish that we had more native evergreens I love evergreens and and when I think about designing a landscape I always want to be using yews and uh, 
uh, junipers, these kind of things, the, and the large ones, the large varieties of pines, you know. But uh, really, we were limited on on the evergreens in our uh, in, in in Illinois. So anyway, going uh, long story short, uh, that's why I picked these plants. But um, so the American persimmon, this is the only native persimmon tree that grows in uh, the United States, and it grows mostly uh, east of the Mississippi River. So this one generally doesn't grow to the the kind of agreed uh, the uh, conventional wisdom is that it doesn't grow much further north out of out of the southern kind of part of the state. So north of uh, Highway 64, you might not find it. But but then again, uh, there's a there's a photograph here of one in uh, Asylum Springs. So so these are some uh, persimmons that I harvested a, a couple falls ago in Asylum Springs. In this tree, it's it's uh, I'm not going to say where it is because I like to go there and pick a handful and go on a hike and have some persimmons to snack on when I go on my hikes when I'm up there in Asylum Springs. But it's pretty prominent. If you're driving around, you'll probably see it. And uh, the fruit is like this really like creamy, honey flavored fruit. That's another reason I like this plant because it provides snack food. I mean, it's a native plant. It's got uh, ornamental value. It's got edible value. Uh, it's uh, beneficial to pollinators. And uh, once again, the reason that I like native plants uh, uh, is that utility. This, this tree out here, after it's planted, doesn't really get a lot of care. So it's pretty much carefree. They, they mow around it. Uh, I don't think they're going out and fertilizing it or, or even watering it during the, during the really hot parts of the year. When, when they planted it, it might have gotten some supplemental care, but it's on its own and it produces a huge amount of uh, fruit each, uh, each fall. So that kind of speaks to that low maintenance and the uh, kind of that uh, quality of, that, of, of, of native plants. And so it's also got, you know, it's got these other nice features, nice fall color. Uh, the flower is kind of reminiscent of a tulip poplar. Um, so there, yeah, we, we see a nice uh, picture of that nice orange reddish fall color. And uh, there's a harvested uh, pile there of persimmons. <clears throat> the only thing to be cautious about with persimmons is there's kind of this uh, urban, urban myth that you have to wait till the first frost. That's kind of the this uh, idea that these, these American persimmons aren't going to be uh, ripe until after the first frost. That's not always true. Uh, they ripen at different times on the same tree, but you always want to take a test nibble of, 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 a, of a persimmon, because if you eat one, that if you get a nice bite of one that's not ripe, it sucks all of the joy and moisture and life out of your mouth, and, and you'll never forget it uh, as, as I have. But just make sure they're ripe and they're, they're, they're amazing. So that's, awesome. uh, yeah. But Austin, I was just gonna say, I have done just that. And you, you're right, they ripen at different times. And so there is a persimmon, a couple of persimmon trees in Macomb and our master naturalist, we saw it, it was at a Lakeview Nature Center here. And they're grabbing a couple, oh, so good, so sweet. I grab one, it's like, like you said, all the joy in life gets sucked out of your mouth and you can't spit it out because there's no spit left in your mouth it's so astringent but so i just picked one that hadn't ripened yet but we all were picking from the same tree mm -hmm. interesting good yeah. to know uh oak leaf hydrangea this is my favorite ornamental shrub and it's uh the scientific name is uh hydrangea quercifolia so it's reminiscent of the uh oaks so uh, uh the uh oak species because it's got that oak shaped leaf, um, but it's got so many other cool features. And again, kind of uh, just uh, prefacing here that this is something that is mostly going to be found in just the Southern part of the state. So again, I, I probably should branch out a little more, but these are the things that I, I, I see a lot and encounter the most. So these are a couple examples here. One is at uh, our Jackson County office right up front and those are just super prolific and that's what they look like in early summer. So they've got this uh, pinkish uh, cream bloom, really nice, pretty profusion of, of these uh, racemes of flowers, nice big bunch of palms of flowers that just cover the whole shrub. 
And, uh, and then in the fall, they also have some nice attractive features. They have this uh, nice twisty kind of gnarly exfoliating bark and those, uh, those nice uh, bunches of flowers turn into kind of a tannish brown color. Um, but the leaves also, the leaves turn into a nice bronze color in the fall as well. And uh, if you leave the, if you, if you let it go uh, un, unpruned into winter, it also has a nice winter interest. If you get some ice or snow on there, it has a really neat visual effect. And so that's just kind of the aesthetic part of it. And so it's really low maintenance, can handle a wide range of soils. Uh, it, it prefers a kind of acidic kind of uh, clay soil almost. So it, it, it's really adaptive that way. And uh, one thing about it, it does do a lot better in shade. So in both of these places, uh, it's in kind of a shadier location. If this was out in full sun, it would suffer. It, it probably wouldn't do very well at all. So it needs uh, afternoon shade, which, which it gets in both of these locations. Um, about about uh, you know about two two or three in the afternoon. That's when it really starts to need some shade, especially in the summer. But uh, these uh, are really uh, you know very, very uh, adaptive to uh, pruning. They're, they're they're very hardy shrubs, so you can cut these down to uh, you know a foot off the ground, and they will reproduce. So they're 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 very adapted to heavy pruning. Uh, however, the interesting thing about the oak leaf hydrangea, which is different than a lot of other kind of full sun, you know, the uh, oak leaf uh, macrophylla, which would be like the endless summer that you see at the garden centers. Uh, this one, the oak leaf hydrangea, it, it produces blooms on last year's wood. So when you prune, you need to be aware that whatever material you're taking off, that's going to take off your blooms. Um, so that's why it's best to, uh, if you prune it in the, in the spring for the shape you want for the next year and a half. So whatever you take off, it's going to need to regrow and then that'll bloom the next year. Um, but, uh, and that's different than like the endless summer where it blooms on new growth. So you, you prune that differently. So you can prune that in the fall and then have blooms on, on the new growth next year. Um, also, really split, uh, it, it uh, divides really easily. So you can go in there and dig out a hunk and it'll, it'll root and uh, you can plant it in the spring. So, I'm, well, theoretically, I'm, I'm actually trying to establish some at my parents' house in Quincy. Uh, I planted some, some divisions last fall and uh, I hope they'll take, we'll see. So that's kind of far north out of, out of their range. And that's why you don't really see it too much uh, in, in the northern, more kind of northern uh, climes of the state, but we'll see. As again, things can adapt. So if this were close to a building, and the, the main reason it wouldn't survive is just because in the north you get longer, colder temperatures, more, uh, more uh, sustained cold temperatures and lower lows during the winter, which uh, this, this plant, it's, it's more kind of native to, uh, the, the, the furthest north state that it's native to is actually Tennessee. So you know that it is going to be dipping up into the very southern part of, of, of Illinois. Uh, so it's there, but as a, as a technicality, um, I don't think we can claim it's fully a, an Illinois native, but uh, it's also the official flower of Alabama. So that's kind of interesting. So that one, I just love it. It's a 10 out of 10. Um, okay, so talking about gray dogwood here, uh, and I saw a question that this kind of speaks to somebody, we'll talk, we'll get to this later, but this is a good uh, species for understory kind of woodland where you're trying to get some control of the uh, bush honeysuckle. This is one, one plant in a, in a collection of plants that you can use that can start to shade out and outcompete uh, bush honeysuckle along with some other aggressive tactics of control. Uh, this is like a shrubby tree and it's very much like a uh, grows, loves kind of understory areas, very shade tolerant, uh, really likes kind of uh, degraded areas. So it likes kind of rough areas and uh, can grow, grows in thickets, uh, kind of degraded or when I say degraded soils, that's less than ideal soil. So soils that have, have a lot of clay or that, or that maybe it was uh, used as a dump site or construction or eroded, eroded areas, things like this, uh, this, this plant can establish and, and do pretty well. 
Um, the flowers are not quite as showy as like the Cornus Florida. Uh, they're more in these small clumps of white flowers. So the flowers are smaller in these, uh, in these kind of corums or maybe umbels. And you can kind of see uh, where those berries uh, form. That's kind of where those flowers are, are in the spring. But it's really unique in the fall when you're when you're in the forest or in the woods in the fall and you see these like kind of uh, gray berries on these kind of reddish uh, uh, stems or stalks there. It's really, really a neat plant. Uh, and uh, this is a good one talking about the shrubs and trees for native uh, screening or, or borders, things like that. This is a good option. But again, got to be aware of the size. You know, it, it is kind of a shrubby tree. Uh, but you can trim it up to some extent, so you can kind of shape it a little bit too. Um, yeah, and it's uh, this one. So this is this is probably one that you can grow in, a, in in most of the state. You'll find this one up up into zone four, so close close to northern Illinois. And then I guess a bonus, uh, you know, I, I, I it's hard to pick three. It's hard to it's hard to pick only three, I guess. But I wanted to just put it put this in here uh, because American Beautyberry, I've heard. From other, you know, really, uh, you know, knowledgeable people that say that there are no uh, native beauty berries, but we do have a native native beauty berry. Uh, maybe what they're saying is that we don't have a native beauty berry in Illinois, but we do technically have uh, naturally occurring uh, Calicarpa americana in southern Illinois. Uh, this one is at a a prairie, a native prairie pollinator garden at uh, the Renly Pollinator Garden, and it's out in full sun. It's just out there, full sun, uh, no supplemental watering, all weather, and it does great. And uh, it's a tough plant if it's in the right environment. It's a it's a very resilient, tough plant. Uh, it can and, and you can prune it back in the spring. Uh, it does fine. It recovers quite well from pruning, uh, and uh, probably the, the really noticeable feature here is that bright, vibrant uh, fuchsia uh, berries, those clumps of berries. Birds love them, and they're one of those last kind of splashes of color in fall because these hang on, and they're really noticeable in, in September into October. Um, so, they're, so they're one of those late season uh, kind of uh, colors, uh, uh, kind of uh, pops of color. And uh, as far as just usage, you know, it's, it's a really dynamic, uh, flexible plant uh, used in borders, uh, naturalized kind of settings. And this one can even be used in kind of more formal uh, residential landscaping too. So if, if you're looking for something a little more that fits into maybe the traditional landscaping, this can be one that's a, that's a good option. And uh, again, it's, you know, low maintenance and it's got those uh, other benefits that we love about uh, native plants. I absolutely love Beautyberry. Um, propagated some from the SIUC campus. Hopefully not terribly illegal, but uh, <laughs> just took some cuttings. It was for propagation class. So I was learning along with it uh, and planted it up in Quincy, Austin. So, and it's, it did fantastic for, uh, it's been over a decade now, but it did wonderfully. But now it is shaded out by a couple of overstory trees. It, I mean, the plant does fine. It just doesn't have as many berries as it normally does. So it- Yeah, uh, things, things adapt. So these, these kind of guidelines or, or restrictions on where these things can grow or, you know, they're, they're uh, not set in stone. You know, things can survive in, in microclimates, you know, if they're in a protected spot and they have what they need, you know, you can, you can grow things in a, in a, out of its zone, so. But it might not technically, it, it might not technically occur there naturally. Again, it's, it's hard to pick your favorites. So I really just thought about what I have growing in my landscape and what I find, you know, particularly pleasing. Um, I'm really showing you today uh, a plant that has um, spring interest. Uh, there's one that will be more summer and there's one that has a fall interest. But this is Cheyenanthus virginicus, uh, sometimes called American fringe tree, but it called, could be white fringe tree or old man's beard. And I think it gets its name from, from the flowers because they, they, they're pendulous and they hang down like a light like a white beard. Um, it is in the Olaceae family. 
Uh, and I'll talk about that briefly when I finish up on this one. Um, in the landscape, expect this to get about 15 by 20 feet tall. It will leaf out late up here where I am. It's usually leafing out about mid-May. And then flowers come on as the, leaf, the leaves are, are expanding. It has a phenomenal fragrance. I am a person that can't tolerate some um, fragrance of some of our flowers. I cannot be around hyacinths. I cannot be around uh, paper whites. But this is a scent I, I just I just love love how this um, the, this smells it smells great. Um, it is in the Olaceae family, and what you might find is um, it's related to the ash family or group genus. And there was something out a couple of years ago that they were finding emerald ash borer on this, but I have not found anything in recent literature, and I might have to refer to Ken on that one. Uh, it might have just been a uh, freak occurrence because I would really hate to lose this. Here's the tree in my yard in bloom, just a farther distance shot. And here is the other thing that I really like about the American fringe tree is its fall color. Uh, in my garden, it is this nice yellow gold combination. And the one that I have is uh, fairly dependable for this to occur every year. Uh, the one I have in my yard is a multi-trunked, I consider it a small tree. In some places, it could be considered a, like a sub shrub or something in, along those lines. It does get a blue droop and the birds love it. Uh, they're hard to see because they're kind of hidden underneath the foliage, but, but birds absolutely love this plant. Um, I was looking up some things about this. And what's interesting, I was looking through Michael Durr in his uh, Woody Ornamental uh, Manual. And what he has done is, is, as far as what is native, he lists it, uh, if it was introduced prior to 1750. This plant is considered native to Southern New Jersey, uh, to Florida and Texas, so it's native to North America, but then he also has it being introduced in 1936. So again, we're, we're back to what's that definition of native and what, what, does that, what does that mean to all of us? But this is a really, really nice plant. The second one, another tree, this is black tupelo. Uh, I, again, love this tree. In the landscape, it's not going to get to be a large tree, maybe between 30 to 50 feet, but there is a champion tree that is in Texas, in Wood County, Texas, that they have uh, measured at 110 feet, but that's very, very rare. And I think what Austin was talking about previously, that depending on where it is, depending on the environment, depending on all the conditions that have led up to this tree's lifetime, you know, some trees are gonna respond differently, the same tree in one situation versus another situation. Uh, so, you know, for most of us in our landscape situation, you can anticipate about, about 30 to 50 feet. It is one of our most beautiful native trees for its consistent fall color. The shape in youth, and remember in youth is a relative term when you talk about a tree, uh, it's going to be pyramidal. And with age, it says that it rounds out and gets to be more flat topped. Uh, I just love this tree when it changes color because it goes through this, um, Trend, uh, a path where the center turns and then it goes to the outer portion of the tree and it, the tree actually looks like it's glowing. Uh, it's just, just amazing. This is the first one I had in my landscape. And I say that because we had to transplant this one 
and they don't respond well to transplanting. They do have a, a taproot. So the first one we had, we had to transplant it because we're doing some cons construction and we lost that one. But I think you can see here, it's starting to get that pyramidal shape. This is the tree I have now. I just took these pictures this past fall. The one on the left kind of shows you what I mean by the inner portion of it just seems to glow and come out. Of uh, Fall color has been described as um, yellow to apricot to purple. Uh, it's just, it's, it's to crimson, that there's a combination to it. I've had this now, I think it's going on about 20 years and I have had not, I have had no pest problems with it. I've looked up, you know, pest issues and there really aren't a lot of pests that seem to bother this tree. In the summer, you have this glossy, nice dark green foliage, and then it does this and it's just beautiful. This also gets a, a small blue droop flowers really nothing to you know say much about but it does get a droop that um, birds do like so it's it's a very nice tree for a landscape and then I went with an herbaceous ornamental that's my specialty that's what I've, I've studied all these years and I put in um, Asclepias tuberosa or butterfly weed now this is going to kind of you know get into you know natives and you know who promotes what this was a perennial plant of the year by uh voted by the perennial plant association membership um and as a perennial plant association you know people think well you're just promoting anything that's herbaceous anything that you know exotic or native or whatever but for this year the membership felt that this plant was worthy uh, to have that. And so I, I just want to say that we're equal opportunists. We look at natives and we look at non-natives. But this is commonly known as butterfly weed. Um, once it's established, it can be a long-lived perennial. The establishment part is the, the challenge. And that's, let me talk about that in a minute. It is native to um, the United States, also goes up into Canada. And it gives us this brilliant orange color. Uh, and it's just, it just stands out. It's just really a stunning plant. It's not gonna get very large. It's only gonna get about two and a half to three feet tall by maybe two feet wide. And it is in the milkweed family. So it does get the traditional Asclepias flower where you have the five petals up, the five sepals down. And like I said, the one thing people have told me is that it doesn't take for them. I have it in the front of my house. I have three of them. It is the hottest, driest spot. If you want to call it a hell strip, that, that's what it is. And this has been coming back for me for probably about four years. The thing is, is that they have what they, young plants develop from a single central stem. And you've got to get that central stem to take because then with age, what they do is they tiller. And that's just a way that a plant is sending up more upright um, side shoots. So put it in a spot and leave it there uh, once it takes. Uh, I like I said, a well-drained, sunny, hot area. I've spoken to a lot of people that have tried to put it in a little more shade or a spot that's getting wet soils, especially as we're going into this uh, late winter, early spring, when we have snow melt and we get a lot of rains. Uh, if you have water accumulating around the roots of this plant, it's not going to be happy for you. And here's just another picture of it in a nice planting. Um, so those are my three. And if I'd known I could have snuck in a fourth, I, I would have done so. <laughs> <laughs> oh, those are awesome. I, I am so happy. Cyanthus virginicus was the first plant that I ever learned to identify in my, my, mm. my foray into the horticultural world. 
uh, Doc Henry, we stopped by the, the building doors to the ag building. He said, let's start here. And that, yeah. you know, no, it's nine when it's off from there. When it's in bloom, it's the fragrance is just phenomenal. And I'll say for the milkweed, I've got mine in our hill strip and it's, it's been doing yeah. good for the last couple of years. Yeah. And, and, and have you heard anything about the boar on any other Kyananthus? It was one report. Was it out of Indiana or something like that? Uh, Ohio. Um, Ohio, okay. That was um researcher, I think it was Wright State. They found some trees. And I think they've they found that it is capable of reproducing in fringe tree. Um, mm -hmm. but I haven't heard a whole lot since admittedly I haven't really looked for a lot, but I haven't heard a lot of news after kind of the initial buzz about it. Well, they were saying that the advantage is this is not as widely planted as ash trees. So, you know, they're they're not in in such abundance that, you know, the emerald ash borer can easily, you know, attack it. Though we do have emerald ash borer in our area. Um, I've, I've been watching it, watching for any borer holes and, and that, but so far, keep your fingers crossed. Yeah, and Martha, I just I just want to tack something onto that butterfly weed. Um, you know, I hear a lot of people also uh, say that they have trouble growing it. Um, mm -hmm. And I have to wonder if it is, um, uh, maybe the source that they're getting it from, uh, the, the mm -hmm. size of the containers that they're being grown in. Um, mm -hmm. I've been growing butterfly weed uh, for several years now uh, in uh, tubes that are about eight inches long. Um, okay. you know, they're, they're filled with soil. And, uh, you know, so by the time that I go to transplant them, there are roots all the way to the bottom of that eight inch long tube. Um, mm -hmm. You know, over the four to five months that, you know, since I had started them. And I've never had one fail uh, that I've transplanted from those tubes. Whereas if I get, uh, and I've, I've tried this several times just to test my hypothesis, I'll get one that's got, you know, say a, a four inch uh, round, um, you know, plastic container that you would commonly find at a nursery or something. Uh, and when I pull the plant out and it's got those circling roots, and I stick that into the ground, you know, I'll still try to break them up, but um, I, I have not had nearly as much success with that. So uh, just just a thought to attack on to the butterfly weed. With with your tubes that you're growing them, are they, um, are you air pruning them? Are they open bottomed? I'm just curious because I know that they've done some research with uh, trees are known to be tap rooted mm -hmm. where they have a mesh on the bottom and the air is actually uh, naturally um, keeping that tap root from continuing down and br it branches out more. I was just curious. Yeah, yeah, no, that's that's exactly right. Um, that that is how the the tubes are designed. Um, okay. I wish I could remember the the name of the company that we got them from. We got several um, trays of them, and I think each one holds like ninety six of the uh, of the tubes, which is really great in two square feet. You know, it's it's really really amazing. Um, but mm -hmm. yeah, we've had really great success with that. We uh, planted 60 of them at the Red Oak Grain Garden and every one mm -hmm. of them came uh, and, and performed incredibly uh, in their first couple of years. So, uh, awesome. so I guess, I guess it's my turn to share the, the, uh, the cruelly yeah, yeah. Uh, dictated three species that I had to limit myself to. <laughs> I found I found a way well, to get I mean, another we, couple species in there though without going into too much uh -huh. detail. So, all right. So uh, I I took forever trying to figure out my uh, the three species I wanted to talk about here today, um, but I finally whittled it down. Uh, and and the first one I'll talk about is uh, slender mountain mint, also called uh, narrow leaf mountain mint. Um, and you have to forgive me, I'm still young in the profession and, and I'm still working on the, uh, the botanical names, but Pycnanthemum tenuifolium, if I'm not mistaken. <laughs> um, I'll never be harsh on someone when it comes to uh, scientific names, because that doesn't mean that you don't know them, it just means you've never said them. Exactly. You know, I can, I can pick, you know, that name out of a list of 500 uh, but I, I still uh, like just saying it out loud for the very first time when I, uh, you know, was doing run throughs of this. I was like, is that is that really how it's pronounced? Uh, but I'm, I'm just going to go with it. So I appreciate it. Um, anyway, so this this mountain mint um, is one that's commonly found uh, throughout the state of Illinois. 
Uh, it's, it's native to uh, actually almost every county in the state. Um, and that's the kind of, of uh, native plant nerd that I like to get to. Uh, I like uh, keeping uh, the native species to the county, not just the state, but you know, that's just me to each their own. Um, I think that this plant is, uh, is, is really underused in the home garden. Um, and I've actually only ever found it once at a nursery. Uh, it was down by St. Louis, but it was recently. Um, so I'm hoping that, you know, this plant is, is starting to catch on. Um, you know, uh, otherwise I'll usually just recommend for people to look for this one uh, at local native plant sales or, you know, use some, some online resources as well. Uh, this one is pretty easy to grow from seed. Uh, I've had pretty great success with it uh, in, in past years. Um, it, it usually does best in full sun, uh, but it can tolerate anywhere from moist to, to dry soil. Um, so it's you know got some adaptability there. Uh, it's not a huge plant, uh, one to three feet usually uh, in height, uh, but it does form this really beautiful, dense, almost bush-like uh, form. So its its habit is sort of this tight, compact, um, you know, uh, foliage display. And then of course you come in um, with these amazing white flowers, uh, which last for a very long time, usually June through September um, is its bloom seasons. But in my gardens, um, I've had, uh, I've had them last from May until October. Uh, it's it's really a, a, a great plant. Uh, so one of the other great benefits that I love about this plant is that it's got some some seasonality uh, to work with. Um, in the winter months, it's got this really great, uh, uh, the, the seed heads on it are really showy. Um, they have this dark color to them, and especially against uh, other uh, grasses and, and other forbs around it that usually will have a lighter color. These ones just really stand out. They bring some great texture, great form uh, to the native landscape. Um, and uh, another great part about this winter interest is that they don't usually flop over um, like a lot of our, our other species do. These ones will stay uh, standing uh, through the full winter. Um, I'll usually burn uh, my prairie, uh, you know, in, in March is when they'll finally come down. So uh, Martha did uh, butterf our, yeah, butterfly weed. Uh, and so that was one that I was going to choose as well. So uh, I'll just reiterate that that is a fantastic native species. Um, but I will talk now about swamp milkweed, uh, Asclepius incarnata. Um, it's another uh, plant that can be found throughout most of, of Illinois. Um, I'm happy to say that a lot of nurseries do carry this one, especially your local native plant sales. Um, you're, you're just about guaranteed, guaranteed uh, to, to find this one somewhere uh, with, with some ease. And again, this one is another that, uh, that grows really easily from seed. Uh, I've grown several hundred of them. And I can probably count on two hands the, the number of times that this one did not germinate. Uh, but that being said, um, and it's surprising to me because of that fact, uh, that this is not um, as weedy uh, or aggressive as a species um, as, as you might get with like common milkweed and, and others like that, that unfortunately uh, turn a lot of people off um, from, from native plants uh, in general. Uh, this one likes to be in full sun, uh, and it does prefer uh, that wet to moist soil condition. Um, but, you know, again, you can have some, some adaptability with a species like this. I've got it growing in areas with more shade, uh, with, with drier soils, and it still does pretty well. Uh, you might get some leaf wilt and things like that if it's in too dry of soil. Um, but uh, I've had really great success with this and, and many different conditions, you know, besides your, your full blazing sun with incredibly dry soil uh, combination. Um, it's, a, it's a really great one. Uh, usually for me, it's in the three to four foot high range, um, but it can get bigger, it can stay smaller. Uh, it's, its flowers have um, different shades of pink, 
Uh, you can have uh, some, some dark pink uh, flowers like this. You can have some light pink ones. Um, and it, you know, that variability is, is kind of nice as well, uh, adds some interest uh, in my opinion. So this is of course a monarch uh, host plant, um, which is one of the reasons why uh, you know, I would recommend for uh, the homeowner to have this plant in their garden. Uh, because who doesn't want to see that beautiful monarch, um, which you're basically guaranteed uh, to, to get uh, at some point in the summertime. Um, I love going out into my prairie and, and my gardens to, to find the eggs and the caterpillars. Um, and of course, to watch the butterflies uh, go back and forth from, from flower to flower. Not to mention all of the other pollinators that, that love this plant. Uh, I will say uh, that this plant is not quite as, as dense as the, the plant that I mentioned before, that, that Slender Mountain Mint. Um, so I will usually um, uh, plant this uh, milkweed with a combination of other natives. Um, you know, you might put in little blue stem with it, uh, maybe a ground cover of, of rosy sedge or something just to start filling in some of that airiness um, that uh, the swamp milkweed has. Some people might really like that airiness, um, but some others want a little bit more structure than what this one can, can give on its own. Uh, so therefore I usually put in, you know, between two and three other species with this one in the, the home landscape. Uh, the third species that I'll talk about moving away from the Forbes uh, and into the shrub category is uh, red chokeberry, Aronia arbutifolia. Uh, I have just recently started um, uh, using this shrub and I wish I would have started um, when I first started doing landscaping when I was like 12. Um, it is just an outstanding, outstanding plant. Uh, and I, I just think it's amazing that it is a native uh, plant to, to the eastern half of North America. Um, this one does have a lot of cultivars um, that can be found at, at a lot of different nurseries. So, um, the straight native species uh, can grow to be quite large, um, which is why a lot of people choose to go with cultivars. Um, one such is Brilliantissima um, that, that I have used in my personal gardens. Um, but it really is, uh, whether or not you're using the straight species, it is a true four season interest shrub. Um, in the spring, you have these incredible white flowers. Um, it, they're, they're just, they're really, uh, for lack of better words, they're cute. Um, you know, they're not the main attraction of this plant, but uh, I think they're, they're really nice. Um, and then of course you move into fall and I mean, you are just, you're just, the, the fall color with this one is outstanding. Um, and it, to, to tie it in with, uh, with Martha's uh, Tupelo, I mean, this one's got the same kind of, of colors that, uh, you know, they go from a dark green glossy foliage in the summertime, which is beautiful on its own. And then in the fall, they're just absolutely covered in uh, uh, this brilliant crimson red. You can get oranges in there, yellows. Uh, and uh, I know that our listeners can't see uh, the screen that I'm sharing, but um, you know, in uh, early October or so, just as the leaves are starting to change, you can still have some green leaves on there and it just adds a really cool um, uh, color combination uh, to, the, to the garden. And then of course, in the winter months, you know, you come on with, with its namesake, those, those red berries, uh, really just a, an outstanding uh, display. Um, this, what I'm showing here is the, uh, the straight native species. Um, and as you can see, it's just loaded with berries. Um, some say that the cultivars will have even better uh, berry onset, uh, better fall color. Um, I have found that they're about the same. Uh, to me, it's probably that size difference uh, that uh, that people will want to go with a cultivar on this one because they can get you know 10 feet tall, 12 feet tall uh, max in the wild. Um, but a lot of people don't really want to have something that large uh, in in the home landscape. Uh, this one does like to be in full sun again, um, but it can take a little bit of shade uh, and it prefers to be in mesic soil. 
um, at the, the Red Oak Rain Garden uh, on the University of Illinois campus in Urbana. Uh, we planted uh, several large groupings of these um, in fall 2019. And, uh, you know, hundreds and hundreds of people pass that garden every day. And uh, as I'm out there, you know, observing the, the plant life and the wildlife and all of that uh, that's happening at the, at the garden, um, almost every day I'm out there, I see people stop and take a photo of this plant um, in just about every season, uh, especially right now uh, with the snow on the ground. It's really great. Uh, the birds love eating these berries. Um, the, the berries are edible uh, and I've had uh, aronia uh, jam before and I can tell you it is delicious. The fruit straight from the, the shrub might be pretty bitter. Uh, so uh, I wouldn't recommend doing that. I have tried it and I can confirm that they are bitter, but uh, with the right amount of sugar and, and other ingredients, they can make uh, a really wonderful uh, jelly or jam. So. Uh, those are my three species, um, and I mean, I could go on and on, but uh, uh, until next time, I guess. <laughs> and we will definitely be having a next time because, you know what, um, I, I'm going to set aside more money in the landscaping budget for, uh, for this year, so we're going to have to have more of you. And I want to also share... Lane, I have, we collected seed for a frost seeding tomorrow and I have some mountain mint right here. Smells minty, it's got the square so stems. So I'm excited to get this into our prairie coming up here this year. So yeah, these were amazing plants that everyone has come and recommended. So. Tune in next week where we sit down with Lane, Martha and Austin to answer your native plant questions. And as always, keep on growing.